Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Whitwam Organics Weekly Garden and Nursery Report. My name is David Whitwam. I am your host. Thank you so much for joining me. I am really excited about this week. I have a guest on, Paul Zamoda. Um, I've known him for years in the gardening community, and I'm really excited about uh, speaking with him today, getting to know him a little bit better, and uh, letting y'all get to know him a little bit better and some of the great things that he's doing and that he's accomplishing. But before I bring Paul on, let's get to our nursery report. Well, while I pull this up, I'll go ahead and run through the garden report. So um, this, uh, I, I'm sure you guys have noticed uh, this past week and the week coming up, the weather is bouncing up and down all over the place. So it's, this is really the time of year to kind of keep an eye on things. Um, it's really when you're going to see the most pest pressure on some of your fruits and vegetables. So as we get warmer, your cool season crops, that's where you're going to see the pest pressure. And then if you've already started some of your warm season crops and it cools back down, that's where you're going to see your pest pressure. Um, <clears throat> basically, pests, I'm talking about like aphids, white flies, um, scale, it's just some things to really keep an eye on right now. Um, you can usually do some lighter treatments with uh, soapy water um, if, if you kind of stay on top of it and keep an eye and keep an eye on things. At some point though in the game, our method of pest control for our cool season crops as it warms up is going to be just to rip them out and start something new for the upcoming season. So it's really hard to kind of tell what the weather's going to do. I'm now kind of, I, I, I'm kind of assuming that it's just going to keep getting warmer and warmer until we hit, uh, until we hit summer, which basically means since that's what I'm planning on, it's probably going to cool off <laughs> because that's what I'm planning on. So it's probably going to do the opposite. So I don't know. I can't really see out past our two-week forecast. Um, it's really hard to tell what our March is going to look like and our April. But, um, you know, at some point, we all know one thing. It's going to get hotter than the Dickens. It's going to get to a point where you leave your house in the morning um, and you sweat through your clothes and you question – all of the decisions that uh, in your life that led you up to this point of living in Florida. So we know that weather is coming at some point. So what I do know is it's not too early to get summer stuff started. So I'm probably going to be laying heavily into that summer stuff. I'm probably going to be doing a light last planting of some winter stuff and then a fairly light planting of what I would consider like you know, moderate crops, the spring crops. So I'm going a little lighter on tomatoes, peppers, um, squash, melons. Um, probably going to do a lot more uh, summer summer plants a little bit earlier. And then a very, very light planting of some of the more heat tolerant winter crops like kale, collards, um, maybe mustards, um, <clears throat> cabbage, and we'll just see what we'll just see what happens. I'm definitely leaving in all of my winter stuff until it completely croaks. I'm talking about newer stuff that that we're planting out. Um, the nursery report uh, we have started planting our squash, beans, melons, cucumbers, all that stuff. We've gone full tilt boogie. Uh, we're about at the point right now of up planting our tomatoes, peppers, and eggplants. And in about another week or so, we're going to start planting some of those summer crops like Malabar spinach, okra, uh, Egyptian spinach. Uh, nice. There's a nice long list on my website under heat loving greens and things. Um, because we do have a lot of customers now, especially since the pandemic up in North Florida, Georgia, and around the country, we're going to keep planting, um, or we'll, we're going to keep in stock some winter greens that we're usually pulling out until they completely croak. Because like I said, we are moving, we, we are mailing stuff out uh, to other areas. So 
So when you get on our website and you look at the heat, I mean, the, the live plants and available seedlings list, don't be deceived when you see some of that uh, leafy greens and lighter stuff uh, still available because um, we're selling all over the place now. So I'll be resectioning off the website so all that stuff makes more sense. Um, in the nursery right now, we got fungus gnats. Uh, so the reason I'm telling you guys all this stuff is I'm in Tampa. There's a good chance that what I'm seeing happening in my gardens and what I'm seeing happening in my nursery could very well be happening in your backyard. So they're pretty easy to take care of. Uh, fungus gnats, you use uh, Bacillus thuringiensis Israelius, I think is how you pronounce it, but it's basically another type of BT that is in mosquito dunks that works more for the fungus gnats. You can't just use regular BT um, in, in the soil. We were thinking about and researching using hydrogen peroxide, but decided that that would wipe out all of our soil biology that we're trying to build up in our uh, 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 potting soil. I know a lot of people use that on house plants, which is where you usually have issues with fungus gnats. Um, so we're, but we're not going to do that. We're going to stick with the BTI um, and see where it goes. I put I put more fans out in the in the in the nursery area. To hopefully confuse them and make life a little more difficult uh, for them to uh, to land and do their damage. Um, so that pretty much. Oh, today at one of my gardens, uh, we harvested a ton of broccoli, Rob. Chinese broccoli. Gosh, if you haven't had that next winter, get into Chinese broccoli. Tastes amazing. Easy to grow. It's related to kale. Um, Chinese broccoli, carrots, um, mustard greens, collards, hot peppers, strawberries. Uh, what else? Nope, that's not it. Spinach. That's why I was forgetting. Spinach, kale. I think I already said kale. And then my garden I was at yesterday, we harvested a lot, a lot of broccoli, uh, collards. Do you not put this on Swiss chard? Swiss chard. A um, lot of leafy greens, lots of turnips. Um, I mean, that's really what you should be pulling out of your garden right now and kind of transitioning into those warm season crops. Um, it's not too late. I don't think if you can get your hands on some 60-day carrots, um, I don't think it's too late to plant another round of carrots. I mean, like, I think the la latest I've ever planted carrots and was successful them was at the end of March, maybe beginning of April. But I do have some very fast carrots and some very uh, heat tolerant carrots. Um, the trick is just getting them in while the nighttime temperatures are still in the upper 60s, lower 70s. So that's about it for our nursery report. Let's get into the main meat of what we're doing here today. And that is Mr. Paul Zamoda. So let me bring in Paul. Um, let's see. Showtime. Him. And there he is. Hey, Paul. Hey, it's showtime. Thank you it's for having time. me. Here. How are you doing, man? I'm doing good. I am not a cat. Um, I'm just live. So here I am. <laughs> cool. Hey, um, so before we kind of came on, you and I were talking a little bit about your um, your education at the small college up in, you said Pennsylvania, right? Pennsylvania, right. Southeast Pennsylvania. Florida. And I was just kind of questioning because you had studied biology, a degree in biology, in microbiology, taking classes in entomology at an agricultural school. And I was kind of, meet the Beatles. <laughs> I love it. Had to do that. Do they have a shirt like that with them crossing the street, like Abbey Road? They could. That someone, would be awesome. Someone could do it. Yeah, I would buy that. Um, but I was asking if, because you went to an agricultural school, if there was any crossover between, like, in the class load, in between biology uh, and agriculture, being kind of poking at, um, you know, how important I feel like biology is in soil and in growing stuff. And you said... I no, I I'd have to say this was in the mid '70s. There was not a lot of overlap 
a, not a lot. There was a little bit in the courses from, say, biology to chemistry to uh, other, other students having their majors in horticulture and uh, dairy industry and, and uh, poultry industry. There was very little overlap in the courses, but when you interacted with your friends in the dorms or on, you know, on campus, you'd hear about what they were worried about in their exams and things. And you could, you could give them some input if you knew it. You know, it was, I got a well-rounded education because of that. Um, I saw how some of the students in horticulture had to memorize like 30 or so. They had to know apple varieties, like 30 different ones. That would be their exam. What is this? You know, they'd show you a picture. What apple variety is this? What um, uh, peaches, are, peaches are these? Now, this is geared to the, uh, the Northeast, mid-Atlantic states, but still they had, they had some hard stuff to know. Cattle, cattle diseases, like what, what causes abortions in cattle? What, what are the possible, you know, they had a lot of questions on things like that. And that could overlap to micro, you know, bacterial stuff. Sure. I mean, especially for diseases. Yeah. Yeah. Diseases, right. Now, I mean, do, do you feel like being exposed to agriculture in that school, you know, had anything to do with kind of where you're at today? Like well, um, when, when when did you get the bug? The bug came from my 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 dad mainly, and from the bug came from his mother, the Pol his Polish mother. She had to rent all her life, but she grew beans in the in the in the landlord's hedges. She grew she picked dandelions <laughs> in the park and made wine out of that. She knew the weeds and how to use them. My dad grew up very poor. They had to grow all their food. And I mean, all of it, even, even the meat, they had to find it or, or hunt it. And, um, they, uh, they, my dad always had a garden. He grew peaches and apples and he even put grapevines in the, in the woods there. And he and always, where was put, this? This is in, uh, Somerset County, New Jersey. Okay. Was where, was where he really started growing a lot. Um, and I watched them. We had to pick beans. Okay, you kids go out and pick beans. They're ready, you know, because we had a family of seven. So you had to go pick beans before they got too big. And there were tomatoes and there was broccoli. And um, I don't remember what el all else, but there was always something growing. Rhubarb, gooseberries, um, uh, pears and apples didn't do well. It was too shady. But other than that, we grew a lot of stuff. So I got the bug from them. It was it was a fact of survival until um, we my dad's job started doing well. Was and did y'all keep up? Better. Did did uh, when when y'all were growing up and you didn't need to anymore? Did y'all keep it up? Well, I uh, I left right out of, after uh, two years after college, but. They were still this, this, this still um, they still had trees growing there, like the, the peaches, the grapes, um, and I'm sure the garden was still going in a certain extent. But uh, yeah, it was there. I mean, because I think what my theory is on why like gardening and growing food seemed to skip a generation or two was because up to a certain point people had to right and right. so it was almost like i think again this is just my theory is that or a theory is that people moved away from growing it themselves because it was almost like an anti-status symbol you know that 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 you could buy all your stuff at the grocery store you didn't have to grow it it almost like gardening or growing your own food was a symbol or a status of the poor, you know, because so many had well, to do it up to a certain point. In my case, no, my, my, my dad, I mean, he, he's supposed to be a poster child for growing up poor. He was born in a stone house in a, on land they didn't own. His father died when he was three and his mother barely spoke English. And they had to do that to survive. And I learned that, that, that 
you know that that you had to do that if you if you could fall back on it if you had to you you're okay now he was he was smart enough and uh fortunate enough to put himself through uh, Columbia College with a degree in chemistry and he did that on his own wow i mean with the help of the army of course there was some army uh, input there but uh he still didn't forget his roots and and i i saw that and it, and it makes you feel good to get clean fresh food i mean it, i i learned that from him i mean yeah. i'm 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 speaking more toward like how we did as a society society like, is, is spoiled they go to the amp or the right wherever and they 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 they're so sure the food's always going to be there but it, what if it's not you know right. the, I see that with a lot of people around me back then too. They they wouldn't know what to do to to grow their own. They wouldn't know. It we've gotten so far removed from localized food systems that you know cuz cuz I'm I'm elbows deep in it with with people and I know you interact with a lot of people all the time so you'll probably know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. It's so ingrained in us that even people who are, you know, all the way there up here with trying to get into this, like one of the biggest humps for them to get over is you can't just grow, like you can't just expect to have cucumbers year round. <laughs> you know, you can't just, it like, like eating seasonally is so far removed that that's one of the biggest humps for people to get over. I um I think eating seasonally is what our bodies have evolutionarily adapted to. And back in the day, I mean, let's say a thousand years ago, they didn't they didn't have frozen anything. They had they went out and whatever they found, they ate and they ate and they ate until they got, were stuffed and then they moved on when it was done and they ate something else. And if it, there was nothing there, they didn't eat. And your bodies that's how your bodies were acclimated you know evolutionarily and genetically and everything now with all a lot of processed food your bodies have not adapted yet because it takes many 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 years to adapt and that's why there's a lot of heart disease and a lot of other things because it's weeding out the people that can't deal with that sudden influx of strange food i mean our bodies think it's strange. It may taste good, but right. it's strange. It's strange stuff. It's got a lot of artificial things that you're that were not found in the wild. Well, and, and I um, also think there was a degree oh, yeah. of always yeah. having to work for your food. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um we'll work there was, there was, I'm sure, a lot of a lot of feasting and sitting around when when you could, but for the most part, it didn't just you know, get in a car, drive to the grocery store, buy it, come home, cook it, and and eat it. There was a lot more uh, energy and calories being labor. Being sure. So I think our anything that was bad for us in that food was able to be you know processed out a lot a lot more easily. And like you said, we would eat a lot of it at once, and then we would go long periods of time without ever eating that thing again. Be it be right. it. Be it you know a whole herd of buffalo, you know we didn't we didn't just eat that every day. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> there was they, long periods of time I think for our bodies to flush out anything that wasn't good. There you go, you know. So you couldn't um, eat pizzas every single day, even though you wanted to. <laughs> but if you had blackberries for two or two and a half weeks, you you pigged out on those. And you got you got loose stool, and then the next the next thing you'd be eating um, uh, some kind of greens, and then mushrooms, and then something else, and then nuts, and then roots, and then you'd re repeat. But yeah, there's yeah, your body your body really needs that, I believe. I I think what's kind of interesting, like there is one food, there is one meat. I really think that we can hand we could handle eating a small amount of it every day, and it wouldn't affect us negatively. And that's fresh fish. Yeah, I agree. I, I, and it's 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 almost like if you think about people for a hundred thousand years, a thousand years ago and back, it's almost kind of like the perfect little little food. 
you got to work for it a little bit, but not too much if you're pretty decent at getting it. Um, it's got a high fat content for for fresh, you know, game meat. That's 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 pretty good. Omega fats, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah which which it's okay. almost like I don't know. We evolved to eating fish. <laughs> I I think yeah. Um, nowadays you've got to be leery about higher on the food chain. I avoid. I wouldn't eat shark anymore. I wouldn't eat right. uh, swordfish anymore. It's too much mercury and PCBs, and it's a shame because I like to like when I dream. Sometimes I go back in time to when my great great grandpa parents would fish for uh, what, what were they shad and herring in in the Hudson River. You can't do that now. Yeah, you can't you can't? It's poisonous. I mean, I would never. <laughs> it's a shame. But uh, those were the good days as far as I grew up. In Florida, you know, going freshwater fishing with my grandfather all over Florida in little lakes and ponds all over Florida. And we would eat a ton of what what we would catch. And I think about that, like, there's no way I would do that now. There's no way I would go into some little neighborhood and fish in a pond and eat the bass that I pulled out of there. No, no, not at all. You know, not, not with all the runoff. I'm not even sure if we should have been doing that when I was growing up, but... Oh, I, I ate a bass once that was in a dairy pond that had evaporated to like almost gravy. It was so nasty and it smelled and we caught a bass and brought it home. And we, my mom cooked it, <laughs> but I'm still here. It was what just, did, what, did, what did it taste like? <laughs> bass? It tasted like, I can still kind of remember it was not really good. Now my first brook trout, now that was heaven. That was like, that was like lobster, but this bass was like, Mud tasted like mud. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and they're probably worse nowadays. That's why a lot of freshwater fish taste like mud. Yeah. So, uh, so Paul, you, um, when did you move to Florida? I moved right out. Uh, let's see, right after, right after working the summer up in uh, New Jersey. Fall, let's see, it was October 77. Found a little a little duplex in Temple Terrace. Stayed there for four years. Um, and I was homeless period <laughs> for a period. How how old were you? Oh, I was 20, 24, 25. Oh, homeless at 24, 25. That's that's normal. You're, well, yeah. you're not living if you weren't homeless for a little while when you were 24 or 25. It's a long story, but I ended up in Hyde Park in a uh, pest-infested, run-down, I, I want to say it's a hovel, but, hovel, but it, was in, it was in Hyde Park, which is ritzy around us. But this one house was not ritzy at all. Anyway, I got out of there and um, moved up to the University of South Florida area. You said that was mid seventies. This would be towards the late seventies now. Then I moved up to the U University of South Florida area and rented for four years, and then finally saved up some pennies to buy my first house, tiny little house um, just north of Bush Boulevard. So I stayed there thirty four years and um, started growing a lot of things. When I mean, when in all of this and where did you meet your wife? Oh, that's way in the future from that point. Oh, um, really? Okay. Yeah, I was I was working at the state laboratory, which is Tampa Branch Lab. It used to be the corner of Nebraska Avenue and Kennedy, right next to the health department. No one knew it was there, not even the legislature that funded us. <laughs> or I should say didn't fund us. They didn't even know us, know about us. <laughs> But I worked there and rode my bike to work, and uh, I would train university um, of University of Florida micro students because I ran the tuberculosis department there, and I would teach them. You know, was, as a supervisor, I would teach the students about the tuberculosis portion of their um, their micro uh, career. So um, I had a student who was from Peru, and she had a roommate named Louisa. And she said, you need to meet my roommate. And I said, sure, sign me up. <laughs> so Louisa not only worked, I mean, she was not only a, a social work uh, student, 
she worked at bookstores because she loves books. And uh, so I went to the bookstore where she worked, <laughs> scoped her out, <laughs> and I just started talking to her and the rest is history. So it's 20, what, 20, 22 years now, something like that. And so that was when you were living where? I was at the time living in my first little house, tiny yeah. little 860 square foot house on 12th Street north of Bush Boulevard. Okay. Yeah. And that's where you started growing? Oh, I really started going to town because I had property now. Yeah, I I, um, I started, it, it, was a, it was a small lot, 60, 60 by 100 foot deep with a little tiny house on it. And I quickly filled that up. Then the house next door was torn down and there was a big lot and I bought that. And I expanded, was it, expanded was it my territory. Trees or like just garden space or both or what? It was both. I built little green, a small greenhouse for the winter. I raised all kinds of exotic seeds. I uh, started planting the heck out of it. There was a huge Duncan grapefruit tree on the new property next door with a trunk like the size of 15 inches. That needed that that lot needed to be cleaned up. Really, it was covered with vines. You don't see grapefruit trees that big anymore. <laughs> no, it it did die while I was there. I was yeah. Really but uh, I, I did a lot of grafting trials, and I brought in a lot of trees. Uh, um, let's see this. There's a really good tree there, a loquat tree, which is the origin from Israel, is probably hopefully still there. After I sold it, it was uh, probably close to 30 feet by now with nice loquats, real big, big ones. Uh, I put in a cherry of the Rio Grande, which is probably is almost as tall, 30, well, probably 30 feet. Paul, let me let me let me let me jump in here really quick and interject because I'm curious about something. So back then you were, you know, we kind of went over. How are you choo at, at that time? How were you choosing these plants and trees? Like, how were you being influenced? Were you just doing your own research? You were you were you weren't part of Facebook garden groups back then. So, like, where did you have a, you know friends that were growing? How did you? Um, how, well, at one like, point, what was your connective tissue to this world of growing, or are you just grabbing stuff? I was I was always interested in it, and I was always interested in um, I was a, I subscribed to Organic Gardening magazine. Okay, years, way back then. Okay, I worked at the Epidemiology Research Center, which is probably not there anymore, but it's behind uh, Steinbrenner Stadium. It's part part of the old W. T. Edwards uh, complex, which was okay. a tuber tuberculosis hospital. It's probably not there anymore, but we did a lot of research on viruses. So Drew Park. It's very, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah the west side of Dale Mabry. And one of my um, superiors was Dr. Lillian Stark. And you may have may know her from uh, fairly recent news as a uh, West Nile virus uh, expert. And uh, I was under the tutelage or uh, overall directorship of Flora Mae Wellings, Dr. Wellings, who was fighting to keep groundwater clean and keep keeping uh, human sewage from being spread on uh, uh, and percolating. We just lost somebody. We just lost. There we are. Um, and uh, she was a member of the Rare Fruit Council, Dr. Dr. Stark was. And... Um, I started talking to her about that, and I said, oh, "I'm into I'm into rare fruits and different things." So, I eventually soon became a, a member of the Rare Fruit Council, and that's a long time ago. That was that was way back then that you've way been way back. Okay, yeah, but I'm still a member. It's been over yeah. thirty years, and uh, the Rare Fruit Council grew and grew and grew until we we became the largest uh, plant group in in the whole area. It's huge. I don't. I don't have the uh, membership numbers handy, but we outgrew the uh, uh, what do you call it? The extension service in Sefner. We we used to meet there because we only had a dozen members. Then we went to USF and we would rent various uh, stu uh, uh, 
classrooms. We outgrew that. Then we bought our own place in near the Taylor landfill on Pruitt Road. It was a little house on five acres. And we outgrew that. Then we went to the Bayshore Garden Club building. Um, we outgrew that. Now, <laughs> now we're at the uh, American Legion Hall on, uh, where is it? Florida and um, Sly, Sly? Yeah. Florida and Sly. That's so right that's where I that's live here. Like it's right there. I live. I live right here in the neighborhood. No kidding. That's yeah, it's like, it's like right there. <laughs> you in South Tampa. Okay. No, right. no, no. The the it's make sure I'm pointing the right way. But it's like I got you. Know, it's like right. It's like right there. Like okay. Maybe maybe two and a half blocks away. Okay. Well, they're having a sale this Sunday. That's this Sunday. This Sunday, and uh, I'm not going to be there. I have. No, I'm sold out. I am propagating like crazy, but I don't have anything ready, so it's not worth it. Um, so what did you just sell out of? What were you propagating? I finished pruning all my grapes, so I am propagating the heck out of all my rare grapes, and they will be for sale once I pot them up in probably by April. Uh, I've also pruned all my uh, persimmon trees, all kinds of persimmons. The budwood is stored in the refrigerator right now until my root stocks are ready. Then I'll be grafting, doing a lot of grafting with that. So when you propagate the grapes, you just, like when you trim the grapevines back, you can just take pieces of the, what, what the, like the tips or the hardwood or what, and then uh, root them? It's like medium size, about pencil to straw diameter pieces. Three buds are best, two buds will work. Okay. Uh, and whatever I don't put right in the rooting boxes goes in the refrigerator for later. Okay. For, next, for another batch. Um, which do you think is more effective to refrigerate them for a little while and take them out and root them or to root no, them right, right, away? right away, right into the boxes? And what do yeah, you mean by boxes? What are you calling rooting boxes? They're, uh, they're like totes, like uh, storage tubs. They're about mm, two and a half feet by one and a half feet and by one and a half feet. Uh, deep. Okay. Drill holes in the bottom and uh, fill them with vermiculite, maybe four inches, fine vermiculite. Soak it down, let it drain, and then you put your pieces right in there. And away okay. they go. Is that, uh, and how long do you keep them in there? Till the roots are ready. It will take, um, hmm. Uh, I, I haven't even thought about it. When they're ready, I pull them. But I, I also root everything else. Uh, capers I put in there, caper pieces. Uh, rosemary goes in there. Uh, tea, camellias, tea camellia pieces go in there. So when they're all, everything gets rooted the same way for me. And then when they're ready, I pot them up. So that sounds like kind of a mishmash between rooting something in water and rooting something in soil. Right, it's sterile. It's sterile. I think I think rooting in water is kind of crazy because the roots, like for instance, people say, "Well, uh, you start your avocado in water," and it's like, "Why? They're not. It's not a water plant. Water yeah. will kill an avocado. Why? Why would you want them in water? Just go with soil." Um, but yeah, it's, it's, vermiculite is sterile, so you don't have to worry about a lot of fungus and whatever <coughs> spores in there. Don't, don't people root in, um, like, so do you use any rooting hormones or yes, aloe yes. or any tricks like that? I use, I, uh, uh, it's called dip and grow. It's indole butyric acid. And, okay. it's, and, and with dip and grow, you can, you can tailor it to uh, hardwood or softwood by how much water you put in it to make your uh, solution. Is it a powder or a paste or what? It's a liquid. It's a okay. liquid. You and then you, add, the, uh, you add water to it. To it, to an aliquot of it. Yeah, you can okay. smell the alcohol. It's dissolved in alcohol. Okay. And uh, you aliquot whatever, a teaspoon out to a cup of water for whatever the mix is. And Have you ever used any of the like old wives tales uh, rooting methods like aloe yeah. or honey or? I've used willow. Willow? Willow, willow in uh, steeped in water. Thank you. <laughs> and is it the willow bark? It's uh, pencil-sized willow pieces from the tender, uh, tender new growth, and you Maybe cut them into two. I think it was two-inch pieces, and you pack them into a, a jar, and then you cover it with water and just let it sit until 
whenever, and then you use the water. And you use that. And what was that? Um, like, what were your results with that compared to the rooting hormone? I, I couldn't tell you. It's been so many years. Okay. A long time ago. <laughs> Dip and grow is so much faster. And it may even be the same chemical. I'm not sure what's what's in the willow, but dip and grow is indolbutyric acid. And it works works fine. So the reason I'm asking is I'm just wondering if like um, some of the things that seem to work for people as far as uh, a, 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 I'm wondering if it's just because it's like an, an, an antibiotic and that's one of the or like antifungal and those are one of the things that are cause i'm just curious i'm just speculating and some mm -hmm. of the things that people say work as a rooting hormone i'm always wondering if it's just got some I'm, sort of i'm not sure you know honey is supposed to be situation honey is supposed to be uh big on that right honey i mean that's rooting? that's what i've heard i haven't tried any of these things i just hear some of this stuff and i'm like huh i wonder if it's just you know the 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 antibacterial properties of that that's helping it the the plant just naturally root without because because they're not doing it in a sterile environment you know yeah honey honey is only 18 percent water and it'll suck the water out of anything that it touches okay so why would you want that on your on your tender new uh cambium that's that's the way i think about it right i th i think I think I'd like to see some studies. <laughs> That's all before well, I start. I mean, I would think, you know, like what if you dipped it in honey, let it sit for a minute and then wash the honey off? Would that be the same as like, okay, you just sterilize that that tip to now go, you know, into honey whatever you're going to put it in. Sterilize. It just it just keeps things from growing. It's like a desiccant. Okay. That's why honey never goes bad. If you, you know, you've heard that and you've seen it. Honey right. will not go bad if there's not enough water for life in it. Now they're now spores. Now you know not to give honey to infants. You know why? I because do know you're not supposed to. I don't know why. Because spores of Clostridium, like tetanus and difficile, uh, not difficile. What, what's in the soil? There's Clostridium spores, such as tetanus, and uh, oh, botulism. That's the one. They're spores. They don't die in the honey, but they sit there and they wait, and they wait. And they wait. And if you give it to an infant who's not has no immune system to speak of, you can you can actually kill them when the spores wake up. I thought you weren't supposed to give honey to infants because you can make them develop bee uh, sting allergies later. <laughs> like there's I have no, no idea no, why. I just I don't know no, why my brain came up with that. No, there's no venom in the honey. It's 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 spores <laughs> of, of botulism. Okay that sit there and wait and spores of botulism can be anywhere. They can be on your carrots. And if you don't process your carrots in a canning bath, you know, when you're canning carrots, you'll kill yourself with botulism toxin because it's very powerful. It's one of the, one of the most toxic substances known. And, uh, that's, that's it. But honey, honey is not, doesn't sterilize things. It just keeps things from growing. Okay. Until it gets diluted. Then things will grow. Yeah. See, I um, these are just things that my brain comes up with that I don't usually say out loud. So, I, <laughs> it it's just it's kind of funny. I'm like, you know, oh, they use the honey because it sterilizes things, and I've heard that that honey is can be used as a, as to sterilize something, but I always thought it had antibiotic properties. But it's making sense what you're saying. It just creates an environment that they can't thrive in. Yeah, right. it's almost it's almost pure sugar when you think about it. Um, but like I said, it's about 18% water, but it's not enough percent water to keep things alive in it. And so you'll, ne you'll never see mold on pure honey. You'll never see it. That's very, very interesting. Yeah. What about yeah. aloe? Have you tried putting anything in aloe to get it to root? Uh, no, I've never even got aloe to grow here. <laughs> There's a lot of things that won't grow for me. Yeah. Right. So you were so you were getting into the rare fruit council from day one. I was really into rare fruits. Um, I was uh, eating May apples up in New Jersey. Now, you know uh, the, the the umbrella plants. No, they don't grow here. 
but that's a that's a rare fruit. Now people that live up north, oh, they're poison. You can't eat those. They're poison. And I'm like, hmm. Come to my funeral. They're not. They taste is, like. Is it something that's just a, like an old wives' tale, or is there actually a part of the fruit that you can't eat, or a certain stage where it is dangerous to eat it? The whole plant is toxic, except for the ripe fruit. Even the unripe fruit is not good to eat. But it's it looks like a little umbrella, and they they grow in the forest. They're really nice little cute little plants. Every now and then you'll see a double a double umbrella. And the flower forms right in between the two umbrellas, and then a fruit. It looks like a little. What does it look like? It looks like a loquat when you when you're, you know, now that I think about it. Same size, same color, and it's juicy and it's got a it's got an, a pleasant flavor. But that was the. Does it have seeds? I'm sorry. Does it have seeds? Oh yeah, yeah. It's got a bunch of seeds in there, little soft seeds. That's probably the weirdest thing I I found and ate up north, other than. Um, growing our own stuff. What else? I'm sure I could think of something that I found to try, but whoa, yeah. The way you were, you were describing me, uh, the way you were describing that fruit immediately, what came to mind was the, um, the, the, the national fruit of Jamaica. Uh, Aki. Yeah. Aki. It's kind of the same thing. Like they eat that crap out of it completely right. But the whole rest of the plant tree, everything is completely poisonous. Yeah. But it's in all their food. They eat it all the time. Yeah, you have to know what you're doing with a lot of things, sure. Somebody was um it was it was definitely a very weighted blog, like an anti-vegan blog <laughs> talking <laughs> about meat. But they kind of did make a really good point of like of the entire plant world, like plants have completely evolved where most of them can kill us <laughs> or have things or have things in us that really aren't good for us. Whereas, like, you could eat most animals, <laughs> like, no problem. But, like, the whole plant world has just involved so many more toxins and things for their own safety to keep them from being eaten by other animals. You know, plants came first before animals, so it makes yeah, sense. Yeah, they had a longer time They've been around all, all these crazy poisons to kill everything around them. Yeah. Oh, there's some cool stuff out there, huh? Um, I could tell you about a Abris precatorius. You know the rosary pea? It, it's a weedy. It, it's in the legume Fabaceae family. It smells like licorice when you crush the leaves, but the, the the seeds look like little peas. They are peas. They're scarlet on one side and black on the other. Yeah, they I know what you're talking about. They're deadly poison. If you break the seed coat after you, when you eat it. Now they've been known to go through through uh, your system, like kids would use them in pea shooters back in the day when pea shooters were a thing, right? Right. And kids would accidentally swallow them, but if they didn't break the seed coat, it would go right through them. Huh. But if you chewed it and broke that seed coat, you would die a horrible death just from one one seed. And that that was fascinating to me, and so I started studying all these toxic plants. And uh, we'll have to talk sometime about a case in Tampa back in the 70s where a mother was put in prison or in jail. She was arrested because they said she beat up her infant. They were sure she punched the crap out of him and the, and the child died. Now, the child was like 18 months, two years, had hemorrhaging on, in, in, in the abdominal area. And the mother was just distraught. And I, I think that the child ate one of these rosary peas and had oh, wow. hemorrhaging. And I sent a lot of information to the DA. I never heard back. I didn't hear a peep back, but she was acquitted. She was acquitted. And I think they missed the scarlet pieces in the autopsy with all the wow. blood. That was, my, that was my feeling. I'd like to know what really happened because little kids will eat anything. Little you know, kids will eat anything. They'll eat anything, God. In fact, you know, you know how people always talk about like, um, like how did we figure out that we could eat this and not eat that? And they're like, well, was there like a taster in the village? Double dog like, hair. It's so much darker than that. Double it's so hair. much darker than that because yeah. kids will eat anything. And so it's just like when you find the dead baby next to the whatever, then you're like, okay, we can't eat that. 
that's my theory. I think you know, I it, it, there's probably a whole lot of things going on there, like desperate people starving, just just sure. desperate, and they said, "Oh, we didn't die. Okay, well, there's some more here. Have some." Right. I don't know. You know, like I think I think but I just watch you watch little kids like crawl around and put everything in their mouth. I know it's like and anything. Any you got to intercept them. Before. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you gotta it, intercept them. You know, and that was that was it. You know. You gotta, you gotta, uh, you gotta keep uh, keep an eye on your kids because everything out there is trying to kill them. So let's <laughs> let's let's talk about something a little better um, than that. I want to talk sure. a little bit about. I want to talk a little bit about your home winemaking. Oh yay! Yeah, because I think that's even though I don't drink, I think that's just the coolest thing. Um, because you grow the grapes. You make the wine, and you enter it in with it, it at the fair and like win medals. I have, I have. I mean, that's 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 like, is wine hard to make? Wine is <laughs> good. Wine is hard to make. Okay. Any wine is easy to make. Now, hmm. Wow, that I could go on for hours about this. Um, wine is is fermentation on something, usually on a sugar, fruit sugars, by yeast, and uh, it changes the sugar to alcohol, and uh, that's basically wine in an, in a simple nutshell. But it it's so it can be as complex as you want it to be. Um, if anyone, I've heard, I've heard that kind of the, the the factor in good wine versus bad wine is more, or is this that just the, what the industry wants us to believe is is more about the grapes and where they were grown and the um, the profile of the soil that they were grown in? Is that all true, or is that, that, that and more? You see, you can that make wine. More. You can make wine from any fruit. You can make wine from flowers. You can make wine from grains. You can make wine from leaves even. I have a recipe for uh, some kind of oak leaf wine. But it's as complex as you want it to be. Old world wines is what you see in the store. It's all the same species of grape, Vitis vinifera and Name, name a wine. You're not a wine drinker, but you've heard of Cabernet Sauvignon. Yep. Riesling. Yep. Chardonnay. Malbec. Merlot. I ain't drinking no stinking Merlot. Anyway, they're all the same species of grape. They're just varieties. Vinifera grapes don't like to grow in our part of the world because of the disease will kill them. They're very susceptible. These are adapted to Europe and um, the Middle East, and they've been there for thousands of years. So hold on, that is a species of grape, and what is it called again? Vitis vinifera. We call it, we just call them viniferas. How do you spell it? V-I-N-I-F-E-R-A. F-E-R-A? That's that's the species. F-E-R-A. Vinifera. Vinifera, yeah. Now over here, you can bring vinifera grapes, and that's they have them in California because they don't have a lot of Pierce's disease there. California has a big industry in pure vinifera grapes. They have Pinot Noir. They have Chardonnay. They have a lot of stuff growing, going on over there, but we can't do that normally. So we have to pick grapes that are different, and the flavor profiles are much different. And the industry doesn't like these new profiles. They don't like these hybrid grapes. So it's a, it's an uphill battle getting people to accept them on, in the industry, in the market, but we don't care as a winemaker. What are some of the new species of grapes, new to the, new, new to the industry species of grapes that you're working with? Well... I have I have a number of grapes that are hybrids. They're they're crosses with vinifera. Okay. With some of our native grapes. 
No, and we have are, what are we our have, native grapes? I'm sorry? What are our native grapes that they're crossed with? Muscadine? We have, I don't even touch muscadines. Okay. And I'll tell you why some other time, but I concentrate on bunch grapes, which is what you see in big clusters in the store, those big, big clusters. Muscadines uh -huh. are little tiny individuals even. Um, we have Vitis, uh, what do we have here? East of Alice, we have Vitis Scenario. Will you spell, will you spell out one of the bigger ones? Because I'm just trying to put it on the screen <laughs> so that people can see oh, how it's spelled and research it. Let's see, East, Vitis, Vitis Istavalis is A E S T I V A L I S, I think. Is that close enough? You think that'll get them to it on Google? Uh, I'm not seeing Maybe. any. I haven't, to tell you the truth, I haven't been seeing any. There you go. That's it. That's it. Lower, lowercase a. As it, since it's a species, species always is always lowercase. But anyway, we have Istavalis, we have Scenaria, we have Rupestris, uh, Vulpina, and Shuttleworthii. Those those come to mind. Those See, are I all... thought there was one kind of native grape. I thought it was Muscadine. That was it. No, Muscadine is 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 a different it's a different species altogether. I mean, it's a different genus. It's now a uh, Muscadinia rotundifolia. I don't deal with those anymore, even though we have them growing in our woods. Theoretically, they'd grow here, but they always die. So I, I just don't grow them. And you moved so, away from them, why? Because of their flavor profile or just because you can't grow them? They, they die here. Um, my soil is very wet and they get crown gall very easily. And, and what is crown gall? Disease on the on the on the vine itself that just suddenly puffs up, strangles everything downstream, and the whole end of the vine will die. And that's I, that's one of that's the main reason why I don't I don't grow them. And is that a fungus or a bacteria or like a, an amoeba? Uh, it's a uh, let me think. It's a uh, it's a uh, Agrobacterium tumefaciens. I think it's a bacteria. Okay. Yeah. So I, I, and and plus everybody's got everybody's got muscadines. You can you can you can get them if you if you need to. You can get them, but you can't get some of the oddball bunch grapes that I have. And some of these are produced. Some of these bunch grapes that I grow were produced by a lot of the late old time grape breeders that are that are dead. They're all gone. Most of them are all gone. There's hardly any more grape breeders. And a lot of their work is lost. Where were and, they doing this grape breeding? Grape breeding. Well, here in Florida, two, California. Two universities in Florida. Florida A&M University still does grape breeding, but they concentrate on muscadines now. And the University of Florida doesn't do any more grape breeding at all. Um, they used to. Um, they used to do a lot at the Leesburg Station, but they don't. Uh, they 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 produce. The, the hybrid, the, the hybrid called Daytona, um, Blanc du Bois, um, a whole bunch of others, and the only one you've probably heard of, possibly, is called Southern Home. You can get that at, at Home Depot. You can get it at Lowe's. It's probably the biggest success story, outside of Blanc du Bois. Uh, Southern Home is looks like a muscadine. It's crossed with a muscadine, but it's not pure. And it's got a weird leaf that looks like a maple leaf. You can always tell it by the leaf. And it's a nice grape, but it looks, it, it acts every, in every aspect as a muscadine. And I grew it and it died, just like my other muscadines. So it's I don't like grow it anymore. It, 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 didn't, it didn't disappoint you. <laughs> it's, it, I just, my, my, my ground is not suited, suited for muscadines for some reason. But I have some oddballs that really do well in the soil. And I, some of them I call orphans because I don't know who developed them. I don't know who bred them. I don't know what they bred them with, excuse me, or when, but they deserve to be saved. And I'm so I'm where doing did, Where did you get them? Where did you come across them? In the I, rare found, fruit I found one on a, a thing called the Florida Market Bulletin. It's, it was, it was a, a, a newspaper, actually, a, a four-page newspaper 
by the Department of Agriculture. You know, they don't. It's now online, and it's it's it shrank to almost nothing. But they had a plant section uh, for sale and wanted, and then they had an ostrich section or ratites, I should say. Paul, they had, what was it called? I'm sorry. What's that? What was the publication called? Florida Market Bulletin. It's it's online now. I think I haven't even checked it lately, but I found I found a grapevine on there once, and I said, you know, I like grapes. My dad grew grapes. I think I'm going to get one of these. And so I did. I got it from the east coast of uh, Florida. And I grew it and I grew it and it lived and it thrived. And from what I knew about bunch grapes in Florida, this shouldn't shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. I've heard that grapes just don't do well. And I looked at it and I, I started doing a lot of work with it. And this is a whole lecture altogether. This, this, this is the grape I call Il Primo. El Primo? Il Primo, I -L. Il Primo. It's Italian. It means the first or the first one. And I named it that because it's the first one to pop its buds in the spring. It's doing that now. It's it's already it's already starting to come out of uh, hibernation. And I worked with it, and I believe I know more about this grape than anyone alive. So is that daylight sensitive or based on weather? Like, does it, it pop the same number of days after the solstice? Or both. You know, I I don't know what triggers it. It's it's I don't I don't even think that the dormant buds are light sensitive. I have a feeling it has to do with um, maybe the warmth, or the maybe the maybe the rays of the strength of the sun, perhaps. I don't know. The warmth on the buds. I don't know. I don't know. But it comes out early, and it's it's a hybrid. I know that it has hybrid vigor. When you cross two species together. The offspring is frequently vigorous, which is called it's called hybrid vigor, which sure. the offspring is so much stronger and faster and better than than the, the, the individual parents. This thing is a monster. Do you have any guesses of what you think it was crossed with? I know for a fact that the that the female parent is Vitus or Vitus Shuttleworthii. It's a river riverbank grape that grows only from about Lake County southward. It can't stand the cold up north. It cannot. I've tried it. I've tried this. Um, I have just about worn out everything except for. I, I think a DNA testing would, would would tell me. Yeah. The only thing I could think of from my research is possibly it's Catawba, crossed with Catawba, but I can't prove it. It's got something else, some other species in there. Do you but think it's it, like a grandparent is a, I mean, that a parent is also a cross? I think it's an F1 generation. I think, okay. it's, I think it's a first off. Okay. And my, my, from my research, I think it's a, uh, produced by the late Joseph Fennell. He did a lot of great breeding in South Florida. He also did a lot of, a lot of breeding with grapes from Costa Rica and Central America, uh, yeah, Central America. He was and what, looking, what's his name again? Fennell, F-E-N-N-E-L-L. -L -L. And he was with UF? He was a private breeder. Okay. I don't think it was with a university. His son, who's who also passed away, I, I, I communicated with his son before he died, was maybe the largest uh, orchid breeder in Costa Rica where a lot of the orchids come from for the market nowadays. I think he, I think he's the, a pioneer of that, but he didn't know anything about his dad's grape work because I exhausted every avenue I could to find out what this grape is. So maybe they'll find a vault somewhere one day with, with his that information. Would be, that would be nice. That so, would be nice. so you think this guy was the breeder, but you got it from somebody else. Is that what I'm, you 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 actually got the stick from from somebody else I, on the east coast and I you got it it was the product from this guy I got it it's it's a long story um i'm not going to mention any names but it was claimed to be a muscadine bunch grape hybrid it's not i mean i took it i took it to the uh to the grape people at the university of uh, florida when i was in the florida grape group uh bra the Florida Grape Growers Association for many years, they looked at it, they had no clue. They assured me it's not a hybrid with muscadine. 
which is what it was being touted as. And I eventually came to the conclusion that the person that provided this grape had actually, I, I, I'm not going to say stole it, but I think they got it by underhanded means. Okay. Because they couldn't tell me anything about it. And they were supposed to be the sole uh, provider. They couldn't tell me anything about the parentage or how it was bred or when it was bred. They couldn't tell me because they didn't even understand the terminology of breeders. You know, so something, they got it somehow underhanded. Well, you think maybe they were visiting someone's yard and a little clip clip was going on? I think so. Yeah. Um, I think so. So potentially, how? I mean, like, how well do you think these grapes would do if they were just left alone for twenty years? You, oh, they you, take over the world. But so, so, so the possibly this plant's parent could be sitting in some yard somewhere, or the back of some research facility, just going nuts. They're out there. Yeah, people have them. Okay. And, I've, and I've been spreading them because I don't want them to go extinct. When I right. have some of these oddballs, they deserve to keep living. You know, if I if I die tomorrow, I'd like to see them being out there and still worked with because is they that, have their uses. Is the Florida Grape Growers Association something that's still active? Yeah, the, the name is now the Florida Grape Growers. It's got a different acronym now. Okay. But if, if, if you look up FGGA, I think it'll come up. Okay. But if so, but if people are interested into trying to get to grow grapes, could they join that? Should they just join sure. the Rare Council and, or, or what? Well, the thing that, the thing that made me quit the FGGA was that they focused only on muscadines anymore. And the, and the more and more I would go and try to try to get interest in bunch grapes, the more I, they blew me off. Why, why do you think there's this huge interest in muscadines? Because I know my experience with eating them, just as an eating grape, if I eat too many, my mouth like burns. Um, they taste kind of eh, and I've heard they're not very good at making wine. They, oh boy, they have their places. Where? Um, <laughs> they have their places in, in like Florida born people grew up with them. So they're kind of hooked on them. Okay. The bronze ones like Carlos and Summit, yeah. they are delicious. And they they do make good wine, but it's very, very distinctively flavored. right. Now you can get you can get the juice at um, Lake Ridge Estates Winery up in Claremont. They make a really good muscadine grape juice and they also make some good wines. And um, there are some good wine wineries, small family wineries throughout the state that make good muscadine wines. You should look them up. There's very small batches. Um, there are some pretty close by here. So there's, a, there's a winery in St. Pete. Um, or, um, there's one in there's Hen Scratch Farms. There's, uh, oh, there's a whole bunch. But muscadines are overplanted, and, the, and the, the group will tell you, don't plant any more muscadines. There's too many. And if you plant any more, the price is going to drop and we're, we'll all be out of business. So they're how, just how are, you, how are your bunch wines as far as just eating them? Well, they're, they're, they're tasty, they're sweet and they're juicy, but they all have seeds and people are like, yeah. oh, seeds, I don't know. You know, they hate seeds. People are spoiled. But have when you when tried we, planting any of these, um, cause you said some of these hybrids that you've gotten, um, you know, obviously you're propagating them straight from their, their genetic material. Have you tried planting a, any of their seeds and crossing them? I'm not going to get into breeding. It's, uh, it's for, it's for a young, it's a young man's game. I'm 67. I just turned 67. You okay. need a lot of time. Yeah. It's very involved when the grape flower is, see that little tiny, that little tiny thing in the middle of my fingers. Wait a minute. Yeah. That's how the flower is. A grape flower is only that big. What? You have to pick off the anthers before the flower opens. So you got to rip the cap off. You have to protect the stigma from weird pollen from the air or, or insects. You have to take pollen from another flower and cross it. 
You have to wrap it so nothing else can get on there. You uh -huh. have to make sure the grapes form and the seeds mature. You have to take the seeds and it's too much work. So you have to grow them out and analyze the, the, the wines and the juice. So and what's their primary get, pollinator out in nature if they have such weird small flowers? Other bunch grapes. No, the pollinator insects. Oh, like, the insect itself would be yeah. there's bees and there's wasps and there's a With little a flower that small. Really? It isn't some oh, yeah. weird tiny fly. Yeah, they, see, they're in clusters. There's a whole okay. So you know the 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 bunch grape is a bunch of grapes, but before gotcha. that, it was just a bunch of flowers, and the the bees will find it. Got yeah, it. they okay. they love it, and they drag pollen from the woods from wild plants and gets all over it. And, but uh, what was the rest of the question? Um, <laughs> I forgot. Uh, That's okay. We're just chatting. Um, I was asking you about I planted the seeds, yeah. Crossing any of the weird hybrids that you have or planting the seeds to see kind of how what they what they grow into. To I planted the guess seeds. what their parent lines are. Yeah, I tried I planted the seeds to try to get an idea what was the other parent of the Il Primo because I knew that half of them should be the Vita Shuttleworthii type, and the other half would give me a clue as to what the other parent was. But um, it didn't didn't really prove anything. I just got a similar grape that was really slow growing. It just looks hey, similar. Paul, Paul, in your screen on your laptop in the upper right hand corner, do you see? Can you? Well, first of all, can you see the people's comments? No, I haven't. I haven't seen any comments. Okay, up on the right upper right hand of your corner, there's a square that says comments. Click on that. Oh, in the here you upper go. right hand corner of your of your screen. Yeah, we forgot to go over that. <laughs> I, I know, gonna, I know. Do you see it? Gonna, yeah, now I've got a whole uh, column of stuff. And, okay, uh, great. I just want to make sure while people were by by the way, guys. Um, while Paul and I are kind of going over stuff and talking here, you guys are more than welcome to pop in and interject. We've got our usual wise acres uh, in here making comments. Hi, Scott. Um, <laughs> Kenny's here. I know that. Um, so if you're in here, all we can see is that there's a certain number of people watching. We can't really see you. So feel free to pop in and say hi. So we know that you're here and then, uh, we're going to keep talking here for a few more minutes, but we're going to start taking some questions. If you guys have any questions for myself or more importantly, Paul, um, so sure. Paul, the grapes, I think that's huge. I, I really don't know of anyone else in our area that's doing what you're doing with grapes. No, I don't no, think so. I mean, not, not even a little bit. Um, but also you're, you're also the heck. I know you're also doing a lot of work with other, um, rare fruits. So what else do you have grown in your yard right now? Well, let's see what's flowering right now. A lot of things are flowering. Mayhaws. Mayhaws are really big in what's a, what's a mayhaw. Mayhaw is Crataegus astivalis is the main the main species. Hi, sissy. It's real popular in the bayous, like in Arkansas, Mississippi, Missouri, northern Louisiana, all in that Alabama. They grow in wet, swampy areas, and it's okay. like a little it's like a little apple, really really small marble size, but they make the best jelly in the world that people they'll tell you that the best jelly it's a really nice rose colored jelly and i've been growing them for quite a while and i've got a um, i've got a cocktail tree and i've got two big seedlings that are blooming now and uh, they love the wet soil we have um is that you keep saying that we have you're talking specifically about your yard in riverview right Correct. are you talking about flatwood? okay flatwood fruit farm we call it yes okay um, and is it, is it native to, it's not native, it's not native to North America. The only fruit native to North America is the, it's native, it's native of the Southeast, but not this far South. Oh, okay. It's a spiny, it's in the Rose family. It's spiny. And we do have Mayhaws or Crataegus species in the area but they're not the same exact species. There's some on USF campus in the, um, 
Oh, around the, 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 the around the religious uh, street there where they have all the little churches and, and so, so forth. There's a, there's a park course you can run. And I know there's some of the, some of them in there. And you'll probably see them up along the um, trails up there in the uh, parks up along Morris Bridge Road. Okay. Anywhere, where it's, anywhere where it's wild, you'll see them. But the, the ones I'm growing are not native of this area. Okay. But they produce very well. They don't freeze. They don't, you can't flood them out. And, and uh, where did you get those from? People, you, like, are these the are these the varieties that you're saying are from Alabama and the swampy areas? And those those are all native, uh, yeah. just 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 mutts. You know, they're just they're just the species. Um, I got the original from Woodlanders in North Carolina. It's, uh -huh. it's a. Have you heard of it? No. Woodlanders. It's it's a uh, it's a native plant nursery. It's in Aiken, A-I-K-E-N, North Carolina, and you can get almost any kind of native plants there, trees mostly, trees and shrubs. And um, I thought I'd try it, and I got my original, and it grew and grew and grew, but it never, it, it flowered but wouldn't fruit. And I realized, like a lot of times, I got skunked because it needed a cross-pollinator, and I only had one. So I bought two more seedlings. And in the meantime, while the seedlings were growing, I uh, contacted some people at the at NAFEX, North American Fruit Explorers, and they sent me a whole bunch of uh, cuttings of, of or scions, budwood, of unusual varieties of it. So I grafted them on there, and they started to grow and flower, and uh, so I started to get cross pollination. Now I've got a lot of fruit, so it's going. So on. it wasn't. So it was cross pollination issue. It wasn't like a chill hours or something because they were from no. further up north. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. They don't seem to need the chill hours don't seem to affect it. That's really interesting if they weren't native down here. Um, oh, well, that's that's a, that's funny. You should mention that because persimmons from up from up in Russia aren't native here either or from um, from New Hampshire. They're not they're not native either, but they do fine here, which is really strange. You know, you would think that something from Russia would just have a hard time growing like like but no they grow like gangbusters and they produce like cr crazy but that's that's an unusual plant though what the persimmons persimmons what's so unusual about it they grow down here from up just there. that it grows down here no that you can't you can't get cherries from up from up in wisconsin no you can't no you, you can't, can't get apples from new york state and then they won't grow here but these they don't care they don't care isn't that weird? It's very weird. And I mean, you know, I've been doing the whole fruit and vegetable annual thing for so long. And now that I'm getting into the 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 perennials, trying to kind of figure out each of these uh, different plants and trees and their nuances and where what's forming when. And it's it's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. They definitely all have their own little uh, quirks and personalities and and trying to figure out what affects them, what triggers them. Um, I mean, as far as the, as far as the, my fans. uh, external, uh, uh, stresses and environments, I'm curious to know what, what the hell's going on actually inside the plant as far as hormonal keys. And, um, I don't know. It's just, uh, I'm, it, it's a whole, uh, Hey, <laughs> I got a saying hi. um, there's a question here last week about chill hours. I was very fascinated to kind of find out that it was it was actually just the opposite of what was kind of affecting them uh, and 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 forcing a bloom. I got a question here from Scott. Scott Smith. He says, I had a great couple seasons with pomegranate, uh, but I didn't prune it. Uh, I hacked it aggressively this winter. Any suggestions? Um, you can grow pomegranates as a single trunk, or you can grow them as a multiple trunk shrub. I just let them die because they don't, they don't work for me. My soil's too wet. And, um, I have not seen anyone have really good luck with pomegranates. So it's up to you. Tr trim it as a uh, single trunk or trim it as a multiple trunk. Just take the weedy little thing, little sprouts off because it's going to keep on keep on shooting up from the bottom 
and just select what you want it to grow with and work prune it prune it when it's dormant but i, I don't have luck with them that's so where are pomegranates from in the world like where is its main where, where are they from and where did the, the main world's crop come from right now Iran. that they're having the most success? Iran. That's it's where they're Middle East. They're, na they're native from uh, Iran in that area. You will find also Pakistan. You'll find um, the uh, big groves are in California. Palm Wonderful. You've heard that, that, that brand. Yeah. They're all growing the wonderful variety. It's, they've got hundreds of acres of, of wonderful but there's so many others. There's there's hundreds of other uh, cultivars. You can get them. You can get the other cultivars, but they they just don't do well here. I feel like that one. If if someone to, if someone wanted to throw money at it and give it about five or ten years, that we could probably have some good cultivars for Florida. Being that they're already they already have the heat factor licked. Um, it it it. It's probably just our humidity and our wet, our My, wet summers that are yeah. good for them. I think the best place to try growing them is on an old uh, citrus orchard that's been decimated by greening because it's it's high and dry and sandy is what they liked. That's probably your best bet. Now there is a pomegranate association in Florida, Florida Pomegranate Society. They'll give you a lot more information, and there's a lot of people throwing a lot of money at them. But oh, I don't know already what, happening. Yeah, it's going on. I don't I don't know what kind of success they've had. Um, we had a speaker at the Rare Fruit Council once from that group. They seem to be positive about it, but their their soil's different from mine. So you'd have to listen you'd have to listen to them. So you think it's strictly the soil issue and not our weather? Yeah. Yeah. Because they're 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 getting fruits and I've I don't get anything. I've been tearing them out. I mean, I know a lot of people who are also trying and aren't having good luck. That's almost why I thought it was more contingent on the weather and not on the soil. Just because if everybody I talk to is having the same experience with them, I would just assume that that's covering a lot of different soil profiles. But everybody's still dealing with the 100% humidity for four months out of the year. Right. And being that they're from desert regions... Also, you know, in the desert, it gets colder at night. It does. It does. <laughs> it's the same deal with olives. Now, you can you can get almost any kind of olive you want and grow it here. I've had I think a dozen varieties of olives, and I've tried them. I've tried so many. Frantoio, Manzanilla, Lecino, Moreno, um, Grossa de España, Arbequina, you name it. I had a whole big list. The only one that ever produced was Arbequina from Spain, but it produced once. And uh, we still have that tree, and all the rest of them died from too much rain. We they don't like flooding either. They they died from the rain. So were they from southern Spain? <sighs> the reason Couldn't I'm not... asking is because if you actually look at southern Spain, they're almost like. Kind of even to where we are, I believe it's a little bit north of us as far as how far away they are from the equator. I'd have to They're I'd have to research that in southern Italy to to Tampa. I'd have to research it. distance from the equator. I'd have to research it, but the Italian varieties, I tried them all. They would never they would never flower. Um, Italy, I forget what latitude they are. It's more north of us. I believe. Yeah, they are a little bit more north of us, but I'm saying is most of Europe is way north of us. Yeah, I, that's why I getting. that's why I think that in, if anyone wants to really try olives, is to go towards northern Africa selection. Yes, said, Tunisia and so forth. Go go with that. Start there and then see what you get, and then work your way north because they don't need as much chilling, obviously. Right. So I feel like we could find more. If we started searching in more areas in India and um, if we were a little more friendly with China as far as finding varieties of stuff that would do better for us here in Tampa, because mm -hmm. you're going to find areas in China more, you're going to find more land in China that is the same distance from the equator and has the same like rain and humidity and stuff that we have. 
that yeah. we have here. Well, yeah, it's a huge country. I mean, they right. have they have everything we have and probably more. Right. And um, they are getting into wine grapes in a big way. Really, China's really starting to accept wine as a beverage. They never used to, but it's it's getting to be huge. Have you started researching, or have you done any research at all, and looking at the areas of the world um, as far as trying to figure out what to grow here? the areas of the world south of the equator, the same distance and on the same side as a big continent. Like, um, so it would be mid Eastern Brazil should probably have very similar weather to us. Um, if you go 23 degrees yeah. or whatever yeah. we are. Yeah. J Jabotacabas are big in, J in Brazil and uh, they do fine here. They can take right. a lot of cold, you know, a lot of cold. They can take a lot of cold. Is that what you said? Cold and water, yeah, yeah. Now, what's the big thing? I People say that one's a pain in the ass. What is it that, that is it just they take forever or? It's slow, it's a slow grower. Okay. And from my experience, when you see them for sale, they're expensive because they are slow growing. So people don't, they pass them up. They keep going by. They say, oh, that's too expensive. They sit in the pot forever and they get so root bound when someone finally buys it, it just sits there in a in a big tangled up mess. You know. I mean, is there anything that people, if they wanted to buy, um, if they wanted to buy one, that they should look for? Well, what's his name? The thing is, if they get the older ones that are closer to producing, that they're probably more root bound, which they could also be. sucks. They could be. Yeah. Right. Unless you know how to prune the roots before you plant, which will set them back. I mean, I've I've had them here. And they took so many years, but once they started producing, man, they were great. Like, what are we talking here? Five years? Six or more. Years? Six, eight, ten. Ten? Fifteen. It depends. If they, See, they're all grown. Most of them are grown from seed. Right. And that right away is the problem. Like, it takes lo a long time. Do they not graft well or something? Or They'll graft, they'll graft but not everyone can just say, oh, I'm just going to graft a Jabota Cava. First, you need a root stock and you need a, a superior scion. Where are you going to get them? So, you, so if you have them, you're probably already experienced, and there's a li that means you're there's a limited um, amount of those. Adam Adam Saf Saffron out in uh, where is he? He's 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 the Jabota Kaba man. He knows How's everything. He's got the, the red one. Taste? Hmm? How's the fruit taste? It's like it's like a muscadine, but slightly different. It's it looks like a muscadine, a black muscadine, but they're right. they kind of red. They're red. There's some big ones out there, some really big ones, like over an inch in diameter. There's some nice ones. Um, I mean, don't those trees get like sixty feet tall? Don't they just keep going? I don't know what the max is, but um, uh, Larry Schatzer has them in Winter Park, uh, Winter Garden, or Winter Park. I think they they are only about 15 feet. I've never seen giant ones. I don't know what the max size. I just thought I thought that was one of those trees that just kept growing. It just takes forever. It probably would keep going. I don't I don't know what would kill them. Um, I'm sure we have plenty of people that are going to watch this video that probably as soon as you said that went I could kill them. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, I've killed I. <laughs> I've killed more trees than than beginners have even planted. Right. You know that's the difference between a beginner and an expert, right? Is exactly. the expert has just killed more shit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've tried tried more things than anyone even dreams about. Like grafting, um, um passion passion flowers. I was I, I was gung ho for passion flowers years ago. I had 53 different types. And I, I joined the Passiflora Society International and everything. And I started the uh, I started selling them at the USF Gardens, and I did very well. They're very popular. And um, people say people I'll show people the, the fruit on my red flowering passion flower. And they, go, they don't make fruit. Go, what, what, what are we? What are you looking at? I'm showing you. <laughs> <laughs> I've had it for years, and I never get fruit. And I go well. You need to know. You need to know what's going on. If, you, if you're just going to look at it once in a while and say, oh, it never fruits, well, you're never going to get fruit. So Is you there have something that you need to do to pollinate them? Are they self pollinating yeah, you, flowers? You, you, some will be self 
self-fertile, not self-pollinating. You have to interfere. You have to go out there and transfer pollen. But for best results, you get pollen from some other species and put it on there, and then you'll have plenty. You'll have plenty. When I was looking, staring really close at a passion flower, um, it didn't look to me like the male and female parts on the flower were organized very efficiently. Well, you mean by they're separated, right? They're separated and pointing in the wrong direction. But that's because they're they're a, okay. What what they like is a big bee, and I mean okay, real, that's what I real, big bee, <laughs> a real big bee that goes all around uh -huh. sucking up nectar. Meanwhile, the pollen's sticking to its back, yeah. and then they they'll hit it because they're big. They're big, not a little tiny thing, but a big bee. Yeah, the big like a big bumblebee, big wood bee, something Carpenter like that. Bee, yeah, yeah, carpenter bee. So a lot of them are adapted to an insect, and since past. Since a lot of these passion flowers come from other countries, where those insects are, those insects aren't here. We brought the flower, but we didn't bring the insects, and we shouldn't. Well, they're here, just not in the numbers. I mean, I see the big bees, just like it's occasionally. And yeah, it's yeah. it's a, um, I, it's interesting. Do you have to um, do you have to vibrate the flowers at all to get them to let go of the pollen? Or no, you lose no. with your pollen. I just, um, there's two there's two ways to do it. The passion, passion flower has five anthers. Uh huh. Five anthers and three stigmas, usually. There's, there's, there's the five anthers and then the three stigmas are coming out the top. It's hard to see. You just rip off an anther. It looks like a little canoe covered with yellow dust. You just right. pull one off. You're not hurting the flower. And then you go to the three and you touch it. Save your Q-tips for your ears or your nose and just do that. You don't need Q-tips. You don't need a paintbrush. Pull off another one and go to the next flower. And it's it's fast that way, but a faster way is just, just do this. And you'll get pollen all over your fingers. And just go to the next one and the next one. And and that's it. That's it If, it, if it, it, in some cases. Um but when you said you have to do multiple species, or that's just what you're saying for faster? It's it's fast to go. If they're self-fertile, you just go from one to the other, just all the way down the line, just tick, 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 and you're done. If hey, you're has got a question about Pakistan mulberries. I don't know anything about them. Nothing about them? All the Pakistan is all, they're self -fertile. They're all, they're all mulberries are self-fertile, as far as I know. Um. I don't know anything about male or female mulberries. Um, I, what, as a general rule, the more species you have of any kind of fruit plants you have in, in the vicinity, the more the more better crops you're going to have. You're going to have cross pollination. As a general rule, that's almost always true. So that's same with with anything, right? Like as a general like rule, yeah, I've found that. If you see, I used to buy a lot of fruit trees in pairs or more, not knowing if if they needed cross pollination, and it worked out for a lot of things. But others, I didn't, and I got skunked because I needed a cross pollinator and I didn't have it. Like, um, what's for instance, Groomy Chamas? I've got a beautiful one. It's twenty feet tall, flowers by the thousands. I get maybe one or two fruit, and other people say, "Yeah, I get tons of fruit on mine." So I so I bought another one. I'll see how that goes. And uh, allspice, I got three in a row. I, apparently they're all female and they need a pollinator. No fruit. Um, Do you need the allspice? Do you need fruit on the allspice? I thought that was something you just mess with the leaves. The uh, the leaves you can use the leaves certainly, but the fruit is like even more powerful. Okay. So, yeah, it's called pimiento in Jamaica. You can buy bags of it in this, in their shops. They look like uh, peppercorns, but they're really powerful. And you put them right. in pickles and meat rubs and whatever, what have you. Okay, that's that's why I didn't. What did you say, Scrooge Chama? Groomy Chama, Groomy. <laughs> I'm not even looking at those. I'm I'm sorry. I'm not. I don't know. I'm not even looking at those. No, that's okay. They're being ridiculous. Um, <laughs> will you spell it? Do you know how to spell the Groomy Chama? G R U. M I, C H M A A. C H A M A, groomy chama. 
Groomy Chama. I'm gonna I'm gonna say that's a, my, that's my guess. Eugene, how's this? Brazil, uh, Eugenia Brasiliensis. Is that better? <laughs> no. Is that look right? <laughs> that's it. And what is this groomy chama? It's a cherry, right? A kind of cherryish uh, thing. Yeah, we don't like to use the word cherry because uh, that's that's people think right away it's a northern. I said cherry esque. Right, but we don't we don't even like that word. <laughs> In fruit council, we don't like cherry. We don't like apple even because there's too many too many things that have that word that are not even not even close. I'm gonna go up north and I'm gonna refer to everything as like a mango. Good. Um, a groomy chama is um, it's a semi-tropical berry. Think of it as a big, a real big blueberry. Like if you get a blueberry that's a, one of the big varieties, it's that size. And it, it grows on an evergreen tree in wet areas. And they're very nice fruit. I wish my tree would produce. I wish it would. How far along are you with your second one for cross-pollination? Um, it's a four footer. I just put it in. It's not even the ground a year yet, but it, I don't know. I'll, I'll just wait it out. I mean, is that one that you have, um, heard of? I, I mean, it sounds like you're kind of new to that one. Have you heard of that one being e easy to graft? Oh, it's not one grafted or is it also grown from seed? So it takes it's, longer. It's a seedling. Yeah. Okay. Most, most, of your, most of the Eugenias that you're going to be able to buy are seedlings. There are a few Eugenias like Suriname cherries that are grafted because they found superior varieties. That so Eugenias, is that the genus or species? Eugenia is the genus, of the, the, genus. New, of the new world uh, plants in the, in the, um, in the myrtle family. Mm -hmm. um, and Syzygium is the old world counterparts like cloves. Uh, I think nutmeg might be in that group. Uh, but yeah, there's the old world varieties and there's the new world. They're all related. Um, yeah, you can graft them, but you need rootstock. If you don't have, if you don't have fruit, you don't have seeds and you don't have seeds, you don't have rootstock. So <laughs> you got to What about, something. what about air layering these plants? Um, I'm sure it's possible. I'm sure it's possible. What is it about? What is it about a like a, a plant's or a tree's structure, like its biological structure, that makes it a good contestant for air layering, as opposed to needing to be grafted or grown from seed? That's a good question. Uh, is there something weird with its bark cells that it's got more? like stem like cells on its bark or something that don't know what the hell they are so they can become roots it may i i really you know i i could speculate all day but i really don't know what's your speculation though well i know i know that you can air layer some trees easier from basal shoots which are shoots like you know how crepe myrtles shoot up at, from the roots those little yeah. sprouts it's much easier to, to, to root one of those, either air layer or cutting, than go up to the tip of the tree, way up 20 feet and, and try up there. So you're closer to the roots, to make roots, in, in other words. But I don't know why some species are like difficult no matter what. Because an oak tree, not an oak tree, but um, citru a citrus tree doesn't always make a lot of root shoots from the bottom you know it doesn't what do you call them root shoots like when a piece of the root is close to the surface and shoots out a new tree right okay right. yeah that would be that would be a basal shoot it's near the base think of it as it's near the base of the tree they're closer to the roots and they want to make roots if you were to pile soil up around them they'll root gotcha so maybe trees that are apt to do that are make better contestants for air laying. Because I know my Jamaican cherries do that, and they they seem like they would be really easy. They're soft wood too. Very soft. Yeah, soft soft woods, soft woods are tend tend to be like easier. But I don't I don't have the full spectrum in my mind of which which ones I. I know you don't with. like calling them cherries, but like what's 
what's um what's the best way to propagate a Barbados cherry? Um, I know they don't grow from seeds for crap. They'll grow from seeds, but you'll get crap. Don't don't do that. Cuttings. Do do a softwood cutting. So don't, you can just do cutting softwood cuttings because the reason I'm asking is because right now my Barbados cherries are pushing out new growth. Yeah, a good time or a bad time to do it. Experiment. See. Um, yeah. Try some that are not real, real, real tender, but try some that are kind of in between. Okay. You know, and uh, see what happens. Because I know some plants are better to take cuttings off of like real barky hardwood. Some intermediate. Some you can take take you know new growth tips off some plants, and that's what you get cuttings better off of. Um, yeah. Off to, yeah. off of to root. Um, I wonder if there's some correlation there on which part of the plant is better to take cuttings off of. Probably making it a good contender for air layering. Yeah, like like with passion flowers, I like to get intermediate, not hardwood, way back towards the roots, but several feet away from the tip. The tips dry out so darn fast. I won't even do the tips. Just go back several feet. And take several uh, a two-node cutting with a half a leaf. You always cut the leaf in half so you don't dry the whole thing out immediately. They work every time. You don't even need rooting hormone. Um, did you see that thing that Jay did with the pineapple? Yeah, he yeah. That he cut it in like eight pieces. Yeah, you can go even further. You can you can get dozens and dozens from one crown. Dozens. That was amazing. You can get dozens of new starts. He could he could have kept going. Yeah, it just takes longer. So that was no surprise to you. You've heard of people doing that one, huh? Yeah. Um, Ian, Ian Grieg is Mr. Grieg is uh, he's in our rare fruit council. He used to work for Dole Pineapple for 28 years, and he was um, I forget what his title was, but he will tell you everything you know, want to know about pineapples. And he had a collection of well over 30 varieties. And so. He'll tell you all about that. Well, let me ask you if you pulled this off of him. Otherwise, I'll hopefully run into him one day because I have this question. Why is pineapple not a major crop of Florida? What's wrong? What's wrong with uh, – why Why wouldn't it work here? It used is to it be a little boy network thing or – the, the expense versus other countries. Labor? It's, it's cheaper. Yeah. Land? Cheaper. All around cheaper. So it labor and land is too expensive here. Yeah, it used to be a crop. They used to do it. Then, so it went to, uh, then it went to where? Pay for a twenty dollar pineapple. I don't know what it would be, but uh, <laughs> it's better. It's better to grow your own, and they're they're still pretty cheap in the store. But they're even Hawaii. I don't think is growing as many as as they used to. It's right. All Costa Rica, right, and yeah. um, down that way. So yeah, it, I just I think that probably takes up a lot of room, and a lot of time, a lot of real estate. <laughs> Lori says, ooh, I have pineapples. Need to know why it won't grow any pineapples. Um, well, you only get one from your pineapple, and you have to treat it right. You have to fertilize it properly. Really? I thought you didn't fertilize them at all. People don't even know. They don't even know what the roots of a bromeliad do. you got to fertilize them down the top, all over the leaves, and down the middle. Okay, so that's where they eat from? It's a bromeliad. You know, a bromeliad's... Right. Are but mostly epiphytes which live on something like up in trees, and they rely on an occasional bird poop. And here's something I found out recently: the the big Sahara dust storms that come blowing across the Atlantic that fertilizes a lot of our native bromeliads. That's crazy. <laughs> they don't need a lot, but they need it down in the center. Yeah. And you know, so you got to fertilize them on the top of the plant and down into the center. Um, Ian will tell you, you have to plant them in November. <laughs> I don't give a crap. I just plant them. <laughs> plant them whenever. Still, and I still hardly get any. Is there, is there any pattern as far as, um, splitting the pups off, not splitting the pups off? Like if you left them in clusters with the pups around the bottom, does that inhibit the next, the next, you know, pineapple uh, or does that not matter or what? I'm not, a, I'm, not a, I'm not well versed in that. So, okay. Come to a rare fruit council meeting and talk to Ian. He'll tell you. 
Okay. But, uh, my my gut feeling is that if you have a lot of suckers, they're pulling from the mother. Yeah, that's my gut feeling too. So, um, yeah. so let's talk about some more fruit that you are an expert in. Caper. Um, capers. Nobody's got capers in the whole world. Capers. I'm growing capers. That's dude. not a fruit. That's yes, a flower. A fruit, dude. You can buy caper berries at the, in Publix. It, I thought it was a flower. It's a flower bud is the caper. But if you let the flower make a fruit, it's called a caper berry. And you can buy them in Publix. They're really? Pickled. Yeah, they're about a, about an inch and a half. Do they Pepper. taste lemony too? I, um, I never actually purchased them, but I grow my own for the fruit. And I get the seeds so I can grow the new plants. And I've been growing them for a long time. They're... It's a beautiful flower, but uh, nobody's. What, plant, what does the plant look like? It looks kind of like a succulent. It's got real leathery, semi shiny leaves. They're thick, like a calancho. Is that how you say it? I don't know. Calanchoe, you know, the mother of thousands, pain in the yeah. ass, pain yeah. in the ass plant. It's got a texture like a leaf like that. It's real resistant to desiccation. So my daughter has a little succulent garden right here. They suck. <laughs> what does it look like? This uh, one? It's gonna look like it's gonna look like a, a non serrated. The one right in front of you in the middle. This one? No, the other way. Go the other way. This one? Towards your chest. This one? Yeah. What's does that have? Yeah, it's kind of like leaves like that. Okay. They're like entire, no serrations, thick. They're thick, so they don't dry out. And um, how big does the plant get? <laughs> oh, nobody saw that. <laughs> what? Oh, it it's it's a real slow grower. They'll get several feet in diameter. Um, they'll get up like four or five feet in diameter, but it takes a long time. Mine's only about two feet now uh, from the original. Um, gosh, I think I've had it 18 years, 15 years from seed. Holy what? crap. How long does it take them to produce? By produce what? From flower to fruit? Like something that you would eat. Okay, if you or want capers. Start them from seed or cutting or however you start them. Cuttings are faster, of course. Um, hmm. Well, it doesn't make a whole lot of flower buds, which are the capers. So if you pop off the little buds, you're only going to get maybe 10 at a time. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out why they're so damn expensive. Yeah, yeah. But you have you need a lot of them, a real lot to to get anything. But it's an it's a novelty. I mean, for sure. Okay. Um, but it's fun. It's a and challenge. What other fruits are you growing? Let's see. You got a mango tree that you that mango. you baby and sure. have a special little house for, right? Well, yeah, because uh, we are in the Alify River basin, which is like a saucer, and cold air sinks in the winter. In case nobody knows that cold air is dense we hit 18 degrees fahrenheit one, one way back and it killed a lot of stuff and it killed my original mango which was um it was a julie and i had it inside the frame with the plastic but i didn't have a heater in it i had it closed up and it killed it to the ground and it never came back so i still keep the uh, frame around it it's eight by eight by eight two by fours and every November, I cover it with plastic. And the mango is in the ground inside. But um, since it stays so warm, it, it, it flowers early and I get early fruit. And it's flowering now like crazy. So, uh, and that one, it, what kind is that one? It's a Glen. It's a Glen? Glen, yeah. It's a nice one. And it's the only one I'm willing to go to that, ex that extreme to keep it protected. Otherwise, I'd have these big plastic-coated cubes everywhere. And... Uh, we get enough. We get enough mangoes from it. Um, how do you and when do you trim it to keep it short and stout like that so you can cover it every year? I trim it, and people will tell you it's the wrong time, but I trim it just before I cover it with plastic, which is in November. Other people will say, "Oh, you have to trim it after after harvest," but if I trim it after harvest, it's going to outgrow its its wooden cube. And then I won't be able to cover it until I trim it back because it wants to get bigger. 
So so I just, the reason know. why I'm asking this is, and I mean, if you can't tell, I'm, come, when it comes to fruit, I'm a total noob. The reason I'm asking all these questions about all the different fruits is because it seems like, like let's say, a, a, I've heard the peach tree forms kind of the, the, the part on the tree forms the year before. Previous. Right? And I know that the mango flower forms on from the tips. So I feel like if you trim the wrong stuff at the wrong time, could you possibly be messing with your harvest? But you're saying you, you do it all the way up to November. So I would assume the answer is no. Or are you careful yeah. about what you're trimming? I want to get I want to get it recessed back into the cube so I can cover it. And it, if I don't cut it back, it, I can't cover it. So I have to do it. But I don't trim everything because there's a lot of branches within down inside that don't need trimming. And that's a lot of that is giving me the flowers now. So that's my question. So the branches you trim in November, when you uncover that thing, I'm assuming, like, when did you uncover it? I uncover it after danger of frost is over because it starts getting hot in there. And then I yeah. got to start carving holes, big ports in the side to get the heat out. I'll, I'm going to say probably the end of March, I'll start start cutting big holes in the in the side. Okay. And and you said it's covered in flowers right now. So yeah. obviously, are, are the branches that have the flowers on them any of the branches that you trimmed back in November? I'm just trying not, to pull this down. No, no, no. not, not a lot of them are. Not a lot. Most of them are down lower where I didn't trim much because they were already inside, recessed inside far enough. Okay. I just, I just wanted to cut it back so I can cover it with plastics and keep the tree alive. And I know I'll get some fruit down. Well, down. I get, I get your reasoning. So do you think that that might be the reason why people recommend trimming right after the fruit drops? Because, right, right. Because that gives the branches time to grow and then the tips to decide, Hey, I'm going to be a flower, not, Hey, I'm going to be more branch. Yeah, they they are they are people that are lucky enough to be uh, in a warmer situation than I am. Right. They don't cover. They don't have right. to cover. So on a side note, I know it's an old wives' tale, but I've been waiting. So I I grew a mango from seed, right? Yeah. And uh, just it grew in my worm bin, and I started growing it. Um, I put it out back. Good. I, I put it out back uh, when I had ducks by my duck pond. I had a raised duck pond so they would splash their poopy water in it all the time. And it started growing really, really fast. I put it in the ground about two years later. Yeah. And within two years after that, so it was about four years old, it gave me fruit. Good. That's Not nice. a whole lot, but enough for me to taste it. Same here. Yeah, that I was that. six years ago. And it hasn't given me fruit since. Now it's huge. Now it's out front up to the power lines. I've cut it back twice. And so this last year, I went out there with a baseball bat and I beat the shit out of it. <laughs> and it's covered in flowers now. I know. People don't, don't believe that happens. But. I don't know if that's a coincidence just because it's finally been eight years or if that actually worked. But the damn thing's covered in flowers right now. How many years did it skip? Uh, about six years. Sounds like you did it, yeah, with the bat. You can also drive nails into the trunk. Jesus and, and and here's the thing. I've given this a I lot of- I thought you were going to tell me that's definitely not what worked. No, it probably did work. And, <laughs> and, and people people will tell you this because they've heard it. It's the, it's the old tale. Well, that tree thinks you're trying to kill it. So it's it's on its last gasp and it's trying to make babies before it dies. Sure. That's what it my guess would be. It thinks it's going to die. And I go, yeah, plants, first of all, plants can't think. And the, do the, does the tree die? No, it doesn't die. It makes fruit. What, what, it's, what I'm sure is actually happening is you're constricting the phloem tubes coming down from the leaves and smashing them, no matter how you're doing it, girdling it with a knife, baseball batting it or pipe. And you're keeping the nutrients from the leaves in the, canopy and it builds up and it builds up it's not going to the roots and it does something to trigger flowering i don't know the exact mechanism but you're building up building up some sort of phytochemicals in the canopy which triggers fruiting there's something because it's absolutely yeah. loaded with flowers right now so now 
the next question because we've been talking. I can keep going. We've been talking for coming up on two hours now. I don't have this problem in my yard, but how do you, Paul, keep the squirrels away from your mangoes? Um, they don't bother my mangoes. Really? They don't bother my passion fruit. They don't bother my persimmons. Nick, oh, you're going to want to know why. I want to know why. <laughs> <laughs> well, it'll cost you. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, thing, the thing is, if you keep your populations of any any animals that eat fruit low enough, you really shouldn't have much of a problem. When you let those predator, not predators, those um, predators to your mango frugivores, when you let them build up to a high a high level, they're all competing for food, and the weaker or the stupider or the smaller ones are gonna find alternative food sources. So they're gonna go for your mangoes, they're gonna go for your avocados and all your other stuff. So if you keep the populations as absolute minimum, you'll have less of a problem. By the time you see um, bite marks on your avocados, it's too late. You have to do this 24 hours a day, every day of the year is have nope. traps out every so, single Let me day. ask you this, cause I've always had the theory, like. This, these things aren't on their normal diet, are no, they? No, it's not even from the same continent that they evolved on. Right, right, right. So, so there has to be a problem when these animals start eating people's vegetables or fruits or whatnot. I mean, like birds, I can kind of, you know, maybe same thing. But, but like little rodents, rats, squirrels, even possums, raccoons, like yeah. stuff doesn't seem like it's on their normal diet. And it's not. And, and my guess is the, the reason why I, I came to that conclusion was because if it was, then people would consistently have a problem. And it's real touch and go. Some people have a problem with these fruits. Some people have it's like it's like this particular family of whatever this rodent is decided they like that. They don't know, they don't all, often even like it. You'll notice people say they take a bite. They take a they bite. Of it. They go to yeah. the next one. They take they're not eating. They're taking a bite. And I think they're just they're just out competed by other rodents or squirrels. And so they're depth they're desperate for food and they're going to try anything. Now Paul, how do you keep the populations in check at your house? Okay, like I mentioned, traps 24 hours a day, day and night. I have one, two, three, four. Five. I have six traps out now. Live traps. Are those like the cat traps? The like, like the raccoon traps? Like what I'm thinking of the trap trap with the door? Yeah, I, I I have a trap collection that will blow your mind. I have coyote traps. I have mouse traps. I have homemade traps. I have all different brands. Um, I like the have a heart style. Or the uh, tomahawk style with the, the like a wire cage with a drop door. Um, I have some I prefer. I can tell you which ones work and which ones don't. Um, but they're all they're all live traps. And uh, if you catch a non-target animal, you can release it, which is which you know it's what it's good. That's for. what you're going for. Why don't you shoot them? Well, for one thing, they Too built a, work? they built a development right next door. Okay. Yeah. It used to be a cow pasture, and that used to be a good option. So now I have to trap and dispose, and uh, we won't go into that too much. But why not? Uh, what 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 do you um? So people get upset. Oh. People get real upset. What's that? People get real upset. Well, but we're. So I, don't, I mean, do you, do you not want to talk about this? Oh, I love to talk about. It. Okay, do, great. So, you know, on anybody who's watching, Paul eats his squirrels that he catches. Um, yeah. So I, I was shocked to find out from you that there's actually a squirrel season. Yes, it ends. So, on I mean, that tells me that tells me that this is not an off the wall food source. No, it's 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 what actually helped the uh, early colonists out out survive the British 
who weren't used to squirrels. They didn't have squirrels in Britain. They didn't, they, I mean, they, in the wintertime, what were they going to eat? Now, the colonists were used to picking off squirrels with a single shot uh, muzzle loader, so they got good at it. And um, the British were at a disadvantage because they had to truck in all their food or their meat and other stuff. But uh, yeah, it's 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 a game animal. It's got a hunting season. It ends in the central central Florida area, March fifth. So mark your calendars. So we're in the season right now. We are right in the middle of the season. Um, What's the best time of year to eat them? I know different animals have different meat profiles depending on what time of year. Well, during the hunting season, it starts September, I think, and ends on March fifth. Or yeah, March fifth. There are, you will find two ages of squirrels during that season. There's the real old timers, which are tough as nails, like rubber bands. You can eat them if you want to stew them for a long, long time, braising them. I prefer the, the, the medium age ones. I call them teenagers because they're tender and you can fry them and they're not yeah. that tough. You just load up your, your freezer with them and take them out when you need them. So it's a lot like chicken, basically, like... I don't mean by flavor. I don't mean by flavor. I'm talking about the older chickens are tough and you need to stew them. And yeah, the, yeah. The younger chickens are going to be more tender, but maybe not as flavorful or is it not the same? It's pretty the same, pretty much the same. Now, if you've ever had a rooster, they're tough. Yeah. They're tough, right? Yeah. That's how the older ones are. They're tough. Okay. But um, is there any weirdness with the males and testosterone, like with, you know, wild boars or anything like that? To tell you the truth, I don't even mess with them unless they're unless they're uh, immature males. There's just something gnarly about them. I don't know. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So but, you, you haven't even tried the older males to see like, oh, that meat's bad. No, but I do. What I do use them for is to uh, as, a, as a kind of like a signal to see if coyotes are around because I'll put them out in the back. And if a coyote's there at night, they'll pick them up. And our, our trail cam will show that. So wait, live or dead? dead yeah. okay i like to, i like to know where the trail cam of coyotes are around in fact i like to know if they're around at all do you have they chickens? Are, and they are here hmm? do you they have are? chickens no 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 the neighbor does you don't eat eggs i take it i love eggs i have them every day why don't you have chickens because they tear up my garden <laughs> you can put them in something no 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 i'm not going there no 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 have you I, had rabbit I'd, I'd yeah, I was just gonna say I'd raise rabbits before I eat chickens because we. How does rabbit, rabbit taste compared to squirrel? That's what I would think they would taste alike. It's real close. In fact, yeah, we I grew up raising rabbits. It's real close. They're just bigger. That's what I mean. That's what I would assume. Their rabbit's just a big squirrel. Mm, kind of. They're, they, yeah, I we guess have, they have different diets. They we have, have different... Mar we have rabbits out in the back, and I, I've. I've I've collected them occasionally. You mean wild rabbits? Yeah, marsh rabbits. Uh huh. The, small, the, the, the darker. Yeah, those rabbits. little tiny things with yeah, with the shorter ears, right? Short, short ears and a gray tail, not a white tail. Yep. Tails, they're bigger. Yeah. Just about the same. Tasty. Tastes like squirrel. <laughs> so, so how do you? What is your favorite way, way to prepare it? Um, stew. I would say a stew with carrots and onions and. Gravy. Peas. Like, that's it. What are your like? What do you season it with? Oh, I to, geez, I'll, I I never season the same way twice. Okay, maybe some. No, I don't know. I'll, I'll roll them in flour with black pepper for sure. Um, so, what is it like? One squirrel per person when you're eating, or uh, not even? Two, two is two is good. Two per person. Yeah. Yeah, I would go with two. Wow, it's not a lot of meat on so them. So there's not a lot of meat on them at all. What well, part? What part do you eat mostly? Like the legs or? Yeah, hind hind legs have the most. In fact, lately I've been just jettisoning the whole thorax because it's just tiny little ribs. Yeah, and you'll get them stuck between your gums, and it's not. There's really nothing to eat. So you're eating the, like the legs and the thighs, front legs, back legs, and the back. Chest? Do they have any chest meat? No, it's all it's all tiny little tiny little bones. <laughs> <laughs> you just you just cut them with your little Joyce Chen scissors and dress oh, them. They, they they're probably really easy to clean, aren't they? 
Yeah, you, if you're good at it, you can do them in 10 minutes. One takes 10 minutes? Yeah, skinning takes skinning is the hardest. I would think their skin would just come right off. No, buddy. <laughs> no. Really? It's, it's almost like it's glued on with Gorilla Glue. Really? <laughs> you don't want to come off. Have you tried burning them off and cooking them with the skin on? No. No way. No, no, no. <laughs> if you know how to do it, it just zips off. Like, it comes off. So you do do it like that. Like, you grab them one and you just kind of well, like actually, peel it off. Actually, you just get a razor blade and you go across the spine, just through the skin, and it's just kind of both ends at once. So Tammy says you can come to my house and help yourself. I'll bet. I get a lot of offers. Dude, I think there could be a business here. I really do. Well, speaking of business, if you keep the if you save the tails, well, going back to our fishing stories before, you can sell the tails to uh, fishing lure companies. No shit. Orvis and Meps, they'll buy. No, them. that makes sense. Yeah, they buy them for the little tuft at the end of the sure. No, fly that makes perfect. They make flies out of them, right? Yeah, flies and um, spoon spoons with the t trailing tail, and yeah. So Michael Thorne says uh, possums are so much meatier. <laughs> I don't ever tried possum. I will not eat a possum ever since I saw one eating a dead rat filled with maggots. Anything that's got a diet of that, I'm I'm just not keen on it. Sorry. Yeah, I feel I, like possums and raccoons have too much of a diverse diet. I'd worry about. I would worry about eating them. They're too much of an omnivore. Well. It's just when I saw him eating that, I can't imagine. But I did, when I grew up, I remember some, some kid down the street. His dad had a possum in a cage he had caught, and he was feeding it corn. And he says, when it sweetens up, then we'll eat it. So that, there is something to it, I think. Now, with raccoons, they have a parasite that I don't want to mess with, and no one, there's no, there's no treatment for it. And it'll make you blind. So I, I stay away from them. Is it a parasite you can get just in cleaning them, or do you have to eat it and the meat's not cooked all the way? It's in their feces, but if you clean them, you're bound to be, you're bound to, um, you know, you could get, you could get it. So, I mean, I really, I don't feel like it just doesn't it, appeal to me. It's so, no, I mean, it's so probably so weird to people talking about this, but like, is this really that different than us talking about grabbing a boat? And going five miles away and putting in and and like literally dropping lines in the water and picking up food that's naturally in our backyard and bringing it home and cooking it. Yeah, it's like really not that different. Like lobsters. I mean, right. Back in the day, they used them for fertilizer. They didn't consider it food. They ground them up and put them on their crops. I know a guy from Jamaica. He he won't touch crustaceans. He says that's the nastiest animal on the earth. <laughs> Well, more for us. He said they crawl around on the seafloor bottom and just they're the they're cleaners. We're not meant to eat them. Yeah, like blue crabs. They're 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 a lot of work, but they're good. Now, who knows what they've been eating? They'll eat yeah, I grew up eating shrimp. Like when I would go fishing, I would eat the shrimp if I didn't if I had shrimp left over. I would always like I, I would eat it. Yeah. Um, whenever we went out to eat, I always ordered shrimp this, shrimp that. Went to the Keys every year, filled up our freezers with lobster. I would come home from school and eat lobster all the time. Um, and on my 18th birthday, I cracked out a lobster to eat it and had my first reaction. And I'm like deathly allergic to them. I haven't had a crustacean since I was 18. I, I'm allergic to uh, New England lobsters. I had blo I bloated up with hives once a long time ago. So I don't no, be I can't. I can't eat shrimp. I can't eat lobster. I can still eat clams. And you know, like univalves and bivalves, just no, no bugs. Yeah, um, no bugs. Crawfish don't bother me. Uh, bugs don't bother me. You know the well. Speaking of bugs, <laughs> can we talk about bugs? They're good too. Yeah, real bugs. Are there any? Um, are there any bugs that you would eat? Hell yeah, cicadas. Um, certain grasshoppers, not those big lubbers though. I won't touch them. Why not? Have you tried them? They're toxic. They got some stuff in them. They bubble. Nothing Nothing really eats them for a reason. Um, no, nothing does eat them. They are native, right? They're native. Something has to eat them then. 
Well, pathogens. What the hell eats them? Pathogens like uh, fung. Is it fungus? No, there's a parasite that'll get them. Um, not many things eat them. Shrikes will eat them. Birds. Some certain birds will eat them. It, that just is weird to me that something is that uh, that numerous in its native environment and nothing eats it. That's something that you would say for like something invasive, right? That's yeah. just not like love bugs. That's just not natural. <laughs> it, it, it seems like it. Yeah, um, yeah. There's certain certain grasshoppers that fly, big ones, big long ones. They're pretty tasty. Those green ones. Yeah, with the brown wings. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. There's something in my something in my uh, genetic background. Something something way back in Neanderthal days. And when I see a a big grasshopper with the wings, and I can catch it. I it's got to go in some hot oil. It's it's coming in the house for. To what sit. what do they taste like? Like shrimp. No they, shit. They even turn pink. Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever pink. eaten roly polies? No, no, I wouldn't eat one. Why not? It's nothing on them. Yeah, but they're supposed to taste like shrimp. I don't know where you heard that. Not from they're me. called they're called wood shrimp. Not from me. <laughs> you should try it. I can't. I'm probably allergic. How about how about earthworms? Go go eat one of those. I won't. Some I mean, people, I've some people will. Crickets. I, yeah. I need to get. Listen, if somebody sat there and ate something in front of me, and I trusted them, and they were like, "No, this is good," <laughs> I would try it. I would totally try it. But I'm not about to go out there and just start catching random shit. Well, you have I'm eating yeah. it. I'll be dead. You have to know a certain amount, like um, giant water bugs, the toe biters they call them. Yeah, they're, the toe biters. Yeah, they're they're perfectly edible. They're very popular in Asia. I would eat those. I would try them. I've eaten termites. Um, well, the other thing too is I oh. think some of this stuff you need to know how to prepare it. There oh. might be certain ways to prepare it and not prepare it. Scorpions you know. are supposed to be edible. Spiders. Meal mealworms, right? Oh, I'd eat, yeah, I've eaten them. Ants, I've eaten ants. I've eaten ants, but that's Honey. just because they're easy to eat. I eat ants raw, like you could just eat ants. They taste like little oranges. <laughs> Honeybee larvas are, are just like you think. They're sweet. They're good. <laughs> I yeah. feel like I feel like um, insects is an untapped food source. It's gonna be a, it's gonna be big. It's already there's already companies cranking out cricket meal and all kinds of stuff to. Uh, you know, stretch your stretch your um, food with. So sissy right. says to try a leaf roller. It tastes like green beans. I believe that. But but do you just sissy? Do you eat them raw? I know that when you um this creeps me out. But I know you know the um. Ooh. Paul, they're on you know the leaf the leaf footed bugs. Yeah, there's yeah, there's quite a few of those. When you squish them, they stink. No, 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 not this. The bigger one. They all. The one that looks like a dinosaur. Yeah, I know. When you squish those, smell your fingers when you're done. It smells like apple Jolly Ranchers. I know. Yeah, they. they that's why people say, "Oh, it's a stink bug," and they'll argue with you till the cows come home. But they're not stink bugs. But yeah, I've just uh, always wondered if they taste like apple Jolly Ranchers. They probably taste really nasty because. <laughs> It won't come off your fingers. You know, you pick you pick stink bugs off your your plants in the garden, and I'm I'm just tempted to just squish them and throw them aside, and your fingers will smell, and you can't right. get them off. I'm not. I don't want to eat that. You know how I usually dispatch the lovers around in my yard? I Snipper. walk around, I just tear their heads off and throw them on the ground. I use my Joyce Chen snippers. They work great. I just really pick them up and take their head off and throw them on the ground. So yeah. uh, Scott Smith says acorn worms are gold. I've heard that. What is an acorn worm? I'm assuming it's a worm that's in an acorn. Yeah, all right. Okay. <laughs> They're probably weevil larvae, but I'm not eating them. Yeah, that makes more sense. I'd rather eat the acorns. Have you ever tried processing and making acorns? I've just eaten them raw because um, there's, there's some really cool ones over near the... Um, What's in what's that park? Way at the end of Cypress. Cypress Point Park. Why? Cypress Point Park. Well, that makes sense. Anyway, yeah, there's some nice live oaks down around that way. And um, the uh, acorns are pretty sweet. Are the live oak acorns the big ones that are kind of longer and oval? Like, they are longer, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Like a pointy oval, right? Mm, like that. I, I guess, but there's a, there's only a, there's only so many oaks around here, so it's got to be a live oak. So what about grubs? What about them? I won't. I don't. There's no. They don't appeal to me. <laughs> So certain Asian cultures eat them. Again, I just, I really have a feeling in the insect world that like hitting the right kind of grub and cooking it the right way could taste absolutely amazing. And then you get the wrong grub or cook it the wrong way that looks identical. And it's probably absolutely repulsive. Eating it. Yeah, I have a book here with all the um, edible insects. I don't know where it is. Well, hey. Oh, here it is. Man eating bugs. That's great. Did you get that for Christmas one year? Oh, I don't know. I've had it for a long time. <laughs> it's got. Oh, look! It's got a place marker. I must have. I must have been using a recipe. <laughs> That's awesome. So we need to. Um, we need to write a book. Man eating grubs of Florida. Florida man eating bugs. No, not this Florida man. But I, but yeah, there are some there are some insects I will I won't have a problem with. Uh -huh. Other, others are kind of mm. any spiders. They don't appeal to me. I I wouldn't think there would be much there. I'm not really into spiders. I I really don't know much about them as far as identifying. Um, they just kind of creep me out. Although they're not dangerous. That's too funny. So, um, any Florida bugs that are a regular part of your diet? Not regular, but um, as you know, any kind of food, if you don't wash it thoroughly, you're probably eating a certain percentage actually by accident. Every everyone does. Mm -hmm. I had a lace wing. I was cooking. I was cleaning some salad earlier, and there's a lace wing in the in the sink. Now, if I didn't catch it, we might have eaten it. I've heard aphids are really sweet, which makes sense. Oh, they, I'm sure they are. They, they excrete honeydew. And I've actually gotten uh, documented photos of love bugs eating the honeydew right out of the, right off the aphids itself as it comes out. I'd have to find that photo somewhere. You know, there's a kid's show. Sweet stuff. There's a kid's movie. I think it's called A Bug's Life. Uh huh. And I, I think this probably just went over so many people's heads. Um, and it's about, I think it's it's either Bugs Life or it's Ants, the movie. And in oh. the ant in the ant colony, I believe it's like the queen ant or the the princess ant or the grandma ant. Somebody <laughs> has got a little aphid that they carry around with them oh, a like a little pet a the whole life. time. A bug's life. Weezy said, yeah, yeah, she verified it. <laughs> it was Bugs Life? I guess. Yeah. That the that the the ant walks around with an aphid the whole time. I just thought that that was really funny because most people don't even think about the fact that yeah the ants actually are farming the aphids Probably and keeping like them as pets, carrying around a smoothie or something. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Paul. I've taken up enough of your time tonight. Really, thank you so much for joining me and joining everybody who's watching. I'm gonna go eat dinner. I don't know if you've eaten yet, but um. Everybody who is watching this pre-recorded, um, listen, if you can't join me live, you can uh, email me at info at witwalmorganics.com if you have any garden questions. Um, this thread will be, um, you know, live on these videos from here to kingdom come. So if you have any uh, comments or questions, just make sure you tag Paul or he probably won't see it unless he goes back and watches the video or tag me. So we know that you're watching the video and you're kind of wanting to have a little bit of back and forth. Thanks again, Paul, for joining me. I'm Thank on, you, I'm everybody who stuck this out. I'm on Facebook a lot. Tampa Garden Swap, garden, garden, uh, all kinds of garden groups. What are the biggest garden groups that you keep an eye on right now, Paul? Tampa Garden Swap. Um, um, uh, Anonas, Raimondias, and Duguedias, um, Passifloras. Are you part of Central Florida Fruit and Vegetable Gardening? Probably. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Probably. 
Anyway, you're thanks for of, having me. You're part of all of them. Remember? Yeah, thank you. Hey, Remember? oh, plug, plug really quick. Plug really quick. What's going on this Sunday again, Paul? Rare Fruit Council is having a pop-up sale at the American Legion. Um, it is at, uh, where is it? Florida and Sly. Florida and Sly, people. That is just a few blocks off of where Sly meets 275. 275 and Sly right around the corner from Lowry Park Zoo. And what time is it, Paul? Uh, I, um, um, let's, to be on the safe side, I would say 10 a.m. to 1. Okay, so about 10 to 1. And this is going to be inside, right, where people are all crowded and it's really dangerous, so people oh, don't want to go. It's no, out, it's outside. Where is it? Outside and masks are required. That's so. right. It's outside in the parking lot where everybody can practice social distancing. There's no reason for you guys to stay at home. Come on out. Right. There's going to be uh, members of the Rare Fruit Counseling are going to be there setting up their tents, socially distanced. Uh, Everybody will have really unique stuff, except Paul, apparently, because he sold out way before this. Well, the hours are 9 to 2, by the way. Thank you, Wheezy. 9 to 2. Yeah. 9 to 2. All right. Thanks again, Paul, for joining me. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful night. See you, Paul. Remember. I'll see you Sunday. Remember, nerds rule. Maybe not right away, but eventually. <laughs> All right. See, see you, man.